Welcome to the Caffeine On Demand presentation course. Presentations are worrying things for many people. It may be that you've got a big occasion coming up or you've got to shine on a stage or that you just want to brush up on the skills that you've already used. But presentation is a very quick route to being noticed in your organisation and it's an imperative business skill for most of us. In fact, Warren Buffett, the famous financier, when he was asked back to Columbia University to do a townhouse meeting with many of the MBA students, was asked two questions. He was asked, how much does he think an MBA qualification adds to the value of your CV, your resume? To which the answer was, he said about a million dollars he felt it added in your value as a to potential employer. But he also said that the second question he was asked was, are there any other skills that you should add to your resume to make sure that you add even more value? And he said that he immediately enrolled after he qualified with his MBA on a Dale Carnegie course on presentation skills. And he reckoned that that had added about another half a million dollars to his value as an employee. So this is something that we think is incredibly important. And it's a very quick acceleration to being high profile within your organization. Most people run away from the opportunity to present within an organization whenever they are asked, and they actually don't really enjoy the, the process of getting prepared to do it. But it is a really, really useful way of being noticed. And if you can crack the skills of it and not be scared of it, but actually master your fear, then it is an amazingly good and powerful weapon that you will be able to use in your armory for the rest of your business life and beyond. Because one of the things about being a human is we've lived around campfires for thousands of years telling stories. And the people who can do that and the people who can make a, a difference and who can rally people, make them inspired, make them feel that they are doing something special, those are the people who tend to be natural leaders. So it's a skill well worth investing in. And that's what this course is all about. So you're going to learn very much from the nuts and bolts about how to structure a presentation, how to bring it alive, how to perform it, how to make it sing, and how to make your audience feel moved in the way that you want to move them so that they change their behavior or that they follow you on the path that you are setting out. And that is what you're going to get in this course. But with you, do bring an open mind. Do bring the willingness to seek out opportunity to practice the skills as soon as you possibly can. And also, to just learn and practice whenever you can with your colleagues or anybody else when you're doing even just a minor presentation, just to make sure you invest the effort and the time to making the whole thing work. So you're not just making a presentation, you are actually producing compelling communication that gets people to think the way you do and to act on the words that you give them. Do you have any idea how many business presentations there are around planet Earth on any given working day? It's probably in the millions. Well, various people have had a go at measuring it, but they reckon somewhere in the region of about 30 million presentations or meetings take place around planet Earth every working day. Now, that's an awful lot of meetings, an awful lot of presentations. And the problem with it is that we probably all know that when we sit through a day of meetings or when you're trying to get the attention of somebody who you want to talk to, you want to go in and present to, those people have four, five, six, seven, maybe even 10 or more meetings every day. And the problem with that is that's an awful lot of information flying at the target audience that you're trying to reach. Now, whether or not you are presenting in an auditorium to a very large audience or whether or not you're just having a one-to-one -one meeting with somebody you want to influence and you need to get on side, doesn't really matter. The skill sets are all the same. And the problem that we find is most presentations are dull, prosaic, presented incredibly boringly and don't engage the attention of the person that they're designed to try and engage. Now, why is that? Well, if you think of an analogy from maybe driving... Everybody knows what a 30 mile an hour or a 30 kph sign looks like. And there are loads of opportunities to see them as you're driving through a built up area. But the problem with the 30 mile an hour or the 30 kph sign is that it doesn't change behavior. It doesn't have any effect really on most drivers that go whizzing past it. Theoretically, we should all, and when we've noticed those signs, we should all make sure that we decelerate and we go at exactly the speed limit or even less because it's very clear what it's trying to tell us. But how many of us hand on heart actually do do that? Very, very few. Now, why is that? Well, the reason that that is the case is the difference between what's 
put into the communication and what is taken out of the communication. How different is the experience when you see in your rear view mirror as a driver, when you're driving along in a built up area, a blue flashing light on a police car behind you? Or you see looming into the distance a yellow speed camera that's by the side of the road. Do you change your behavior then? You bet you do, because you know that it carries consequences. The takeout of that communication of the blue flashing light or the speed camera is fundamentally different from the takeout of the 30 mile an hour sign. And that's true of presentations. Most presentations that go on around planet Earth on any given day are basically like 30 mile an hour signs. It's very clear what they're trying to say. They're presented in a relatively straightforward manner, but they have zero effect on the target audience that they are trying to impact. And the reason for that is because they're dull. They're dull on the page. They're dull in front of the audience. They don't come alive and they don't sound compelling. They don't sound urgent. They don't sound like anyone has to do anything as a consequence of hearing them because they're normally produced on a PowerPoint template. They're normally produced on a cut and paste because they're just lifted from a previous presentation with a few things that are changed for the relevance of of the audience that this one's going to be made to. They're not rehearsed. They're not done in any way that engages with the audience. They're not done with any uh, forethought of who the audience might be, what sort of mood they might be in, what sort of receptivity they might have and what's important to them. So we go in and we basically present the equivalent of 30 mile an hour signs. And are we ever surprised that as a consequence, nothing ever changes, nothing ever happens, just like they don't when you're driving past them on the road. So what this program, what this course is all about is how do you stop doing 30 mile an hour sign presentations and how do you turn your compelling communication into something that has the equivalent outcome of a speed camera or a flashing blue light from a police car in the rear view mirror when you're driving along. That is the essence of great communication. That is the essence of what you're trying to strive to achieve when you present to an audience, whether it's to a very important client that you're trying to reach or to a group of colleagues or to strangers in a room where you're presenting at a conference. That is what this course is about. What's the acid test of whether or not you've done a great presentation? Well, we think, like most things, it's very, very simple. It's what we call the taxi test. When you present to an audience, and maybe it's in an auditorium, or you've been to their offices, or whatever it is, when that target audience leaves the building, and they've seen your presentation, and they get in the taxi, and they go off back to their office, or they go off home, What are the things that they say to each other when they get into that taxi that they've remembered about you and your presentation? And the honest truth is the taxi test really boils down to just two things. Normally, most people remember something about you, you physically, the way you present, the way you look, the way you sound, maybe what you were wearing, maybe the way your hair is or where you wear glasses, or there'll be something physical, a physical attribute that they will take away with them, which will help anchor in their mind what you were and what you were like. The other thing they'll remember is something that you said. And the big trick of being a good presenter is to make sure that the thing they remember about what you said is the one thing you want them to remember. Not a hostage to fortune, not something that you casually said uh, as a sort of throwaway comment or something that you, you maybe said that you hadn't really thought about, but which stuck in their mind. And you hear that again and again, that that happens. People say things off the cuff. They say something or they come over and say something or give something away about themselves, but they don't think about it. And yet somehow it wedges in people's memory. They The whole point of being a good, compelling presenter is to make sure that the singularity of the message that you're trying to convey lands with the audience so that when they all go away, they have one single minded message they've got from you, one thing they remember about you. And that way you've been consistent in your communication. And that way you have a chance that you will lodge in their memory forevermore. How many of us go away from presentations that we've seen and literally within 24 hours, we just can't remember a single thing about what was said. We may have a vague notion of what maybe they talked about or something about the way they looked or the way they acted, but most of it doesn't stick because they have just presented a 30 mile an hour sign. But when somebody comes along and really engages the audience and is very, very on message and very precise about what it is that they are giving the audience to take away in terms of the content of what they're providing and everything they do brings alive that message 
then you remember it. That is a piece of communication that goes down and in the annals of uh, corporate history becomes something that really does get remembered and gets acted upon. One of the key things to remember when you are presenting to an audience is the amount of power that you actually possess in the room. It doesn't matter whether or not it's a huge cavernous hall or just a regular boardroom or even just a small meeting room. When you are speaking, when you're presenting, you have an enormous amount of power. If you don't believe us, just think about the power that somebody like a nightclub comic has when they stand on stage under the spotlight with a microphone. Because if you're in the audience, especially if you're on the front row, what is the worst thing that can happen to you as a member of that audience when you've gone along to watch a comedian? Absolutely right. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you end up in the spotlight and that the microphone is thrust under your nose by the, the comedian and he asks you a question. And then suddenly the transference of attention of the entire audience you can feel burning through the back of your neck. That is a scary place to be. Now, most presenters feel like that when they stand on a stage. You don't want to feel like that. That's just being incredibly self-conscious. The trick that most good presenters have is they recognize the power they have. They recognize that when you have that microphone, when you are center stage, that's a great place to be. And if you look comfortable in that place, then the audience will relax and they will feel comfortable too. But if you look sweaty and nervous and your voice is hesitant and you haven't got a command of your emotions, then that will transmit to the audience as well. Anyone who's ever seen a best man, maybe some of you have been speaking at something like a wedding where you are the best man or you are the chief bridesmaid and you are making a speech and your job is to entertain the audience. We all know that within a microsecond of standing up and starting to make their speech, the audience picks up very quickly whether or not the best man or the chief bridesmaid or whoever's making the speech is in command of the situation and of their, of their material or whether or not they're not. And you can watch the body language of the audience either lean forward with anticipation that this is going to be good and fun or lean back and bug out because they just feel embarrassed on behalf of the speaker. They just feel that this is not going to be something that the speaker isn't going to enjoy and also that therefore the audience is not going to relax into either. You don't want to be in that place. So you need to make sure that when you stand up and when your moment in the spotlight comes, you are prepared for it. You want to have it. You want to enjoy it. You want the audience to enjoy it. And the great trick of being a good presenter is just to remember that whatever's going on in your own head, all you're really doing is having a conversation with another person. That's it. It's just there are lots of other people in the audience and you want to make sure that you use the space, talk to the people and just come over as naturally as you would if you were just having a little fireside chat with somebody with a cup of coffee or something like that. That's what great orators do. That's what great speakers do. And those are the tricks that you need to be able to do. But to be able to do that, you need to be very well prepared. You need to be very well rehearsed and you need to practice and practice whatever you're going to say so that it comes over as natural. Even the great orators, even people like Winston Churchill, John F. Kennedy, they rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and made sure that even their off the cuff remarks, their ad libs, even those were well crafted. And again, Again, nightclub comedians, if they get heckled, you know perfectly well that you know who's going to win on that particular exchange and it's not going to be the heckler because they have already thought about every heckle that could be conceivably thrown at them so that when they are there on stage, somebody throws them a comment, they'll go back with a rapier-like comment back. That makes them feel confident and it boosts their confidence and it boosts the confidence of the audience because there is nothing more off-putting than somebody heckling and leaving the speaker on the stage completely lost for words. All of that takes preparation and discipline, and that is the essence of being a great presenter. So, we've got some really good tips and ways that we think that you need to think about putting your presentation together before you perform it. And we use a mnemonic called PRIME. There's the planning and preparation and how you put the words together that can really help you deliver it in the best possible way. Because the most important thing is you in your presentation. That's what will convince your audience, not the words, it'll be you behind the words that's the important thing. 
but how you plan and put it together can be really important. Then there's the reason behind your communication. Why are you there with that particular audience in that presentation? What is it that they need to take away? So you need to have a clear reason or objective for your presentation. You also need to think about the impact you have. You need to be able to be in the moment, adapting on your feet to the audience in the room. Because so often we're a bit like the frozen rabbit in the headlights and we're so busy running through the script in our heads and all the things that we've got to say that it's hard for us to be really in that moment and be as impactful as we can. Then there's your mission. How much passion are you speaking with? Can you really communicate the meaning of your presentation? Because if you're not behind what you're talking about, your audience will pick up on it. And then finally, there's your energy. Everything that you are and the way you communicate needs to be in that presentation. And so often we kind of put on a presentation persona, but it's about you being you. And that's sometimes very hard when you're under the pressure of being on show. So how can you communicate with energy? We're going to now run through some really key things around planning and preparation that are just absolutely fundamental and easy for you to apply in how to put together a presentation. The first thing that you really need to think about is who is your audience? As I'm speaking to you now, I can roughly speak at 150 words a minute. You can think much quicker than I can speak. You can think at roughly 500 words a minute. So as I'm speaking to you now, you could just drift off and be thinking about something else. My job is to really hold your attention on my message. And that is to stop you going down the route 350, which is the discrepancy between 150 and 500 words a minute. And the best way I can do that is to talk to you about your concerns and your needs. Because guess what? The one thing that's constantly fascinating to me is me. So you need to think about your client's point of view in your presentation. If they're in marketing, they're going to want to hear about the marketing. If they're in finance, they're going to want to know the bottom line and the costs. And it seems very obvious, but so often we talk from our point of view and we don't put ourselves in the audience's shoes. It's absolutely the most fundamental thing. Then, of course, you need to think why you're speaking. Why are you in that room with that group of people in that situation? It's often what's called in the presentation world, the elevator pitch. Somebody important misses your presentation. They meet you by the elevator or by the lift and they say, I'm so sorry, I couldn't attend your presentation. What was it about? And you've got to be able to say in a couple of sentences or a paragraph at the very most, exactly what the key message is. And I think it's really fundamental to have that front of mind in any presentation you give. Why are you speaking to that audience? If you think about it, if you go to a fantastic shop that's a very tasteful shop, very often they have one thing in the shop window and it's beautifully lit and they entice you in. If you go to a fairly cheap marketing outlet, they'll have everything in the shop window and they'll shove everything in in the hope that passers-by will come in and choose something. Less is more. It's far better to position your key idea in your presentation and talk around that than bombard people with too much information. In our experience, most presentations are way too long. We'll say to you often, less is more. So why are you speaking? Then you can start to think about what you're going to say. And at this stage, we suggest that you don't limit yourself to writing a script or writing straight to PowerPoint if that's what you're going to have to give a PowerPoint presentation. Use a mind map. Think of several ideas. Think of your audience. Think while you're speaking. And think of all the things that you could include in that presentation. You might want to write them on separate cards and you can jumble them about and then put them into an order that seems to make sense and has a flow or a story to it. But don't start writing straight away. Have a bit of a fiddle with the overview. Then ask yourself, where am I presenting? And as an actor, it is really important that centre stage is the most important place. And so often in presentation, especially if you're using PowerPoint, what often happens is that the presenter puts the PowerPoint in the middle and then spends a lot of time dancing around the edge 
trying to get the focus of the audience. If you can centre yourself in the centre, make sure you do. Uh, what you want to avoid is having all the PowerPoint written across your face. It's not a good look. So think about that. Think about where you position yourself. Think about where you're going to uh, position your audience in relation to you as well. Because if you're too far away from them and you're busy looking up at your PowerPoint, the chances are they will wander down that route 350. If you're too close to them and you're right in their face, they will feel a little bombarded. So actually get conscious of the seating in the room and whether you're going to sit or stand and be conscious that you're choosing for the right reason. The final thing to think about is how are you presenting? And honestly, if you've answered the first four questions, who is your audience, why you're speaking, what you need to say and where you're performing, very often the how will present itself easily. Does it need to be a formal suited and booted presentation? Does it need to have PowerPoint? Or can it be a very re relaxed conversation with your client? So the next principle we'd like to talk you through is structuring your presentation. And people often get very concerned about how to structure a good communication. In fact, any good presentation, like any good story, has a beginning, a middle and an end. And one of the most key places is the beginning. And it's often where we're most nervous in a presentation because the adrenaline has kicked in, the nerves are there, we're just like that frozen rabbit in the headlights. So how you start is very important. If you think about it, when you go to the theatre, the curtain opens on the theatre and the lights light up and you will decide whether you're really going to put your energy into enjoying that play or not. And that's exactly like you in a presentation. You need to think about how you're going to start. The audience will make a decision about you in the first 30 seconds of you opening your mouth. So create a good first impression. Start with something strong and impactful. Rehearse it to bits, know it inside out, because if you start well, you tend to go on well. The end is the other really key place. How we end is very important. So often in presentations, we're so relieved to get to the end, we'll just go, thank you, any questions? And we'll drop all the energy on the floor. So if you can, write your opening sentence, commit it to memory, and write your closing paragraph. And your closing paragraph should be a call to arms. It should be a absolutely pulling together everything that you've spoken about in that presentation. It should be strong, it should be bold, and you shouldn't be afraid of repeating yourself. Because what they hear last is often what they remember longest. So make sure you start well, make sure you end well. The difficult part is the middle. And the middle is often what I call the bore zone. Zzz. The audience drops off, they go down the route 350, they start to think about other things. So your job is, as I said before, less is more. Keep it snappy, keep it to the point, make it relevant. Try and change the energy in the middle and think what your key messages are. Don't get tempted to lure them into far too much detail. In a way, a presentation is like the football match. And when we see a football match at the news, we often see the edited highlights, we see the important bits. And if we really are interested in football, we'll go and look at the whole match. But often when you're giving a presentation, you're doing the work for an audience, you're giving them the overview or the edited highlights. If they want to, they can go away and look at the document and look in depth at the final detail. We way overestimate how much people listen. So don't be tempted to pad out the middle and go on for days. Keep it short and snappy. If it feels like it's too long, take it out. So we've said how important opening your presentation is. And there's a really great technique that you can use that we call the ABCD. A stands for attention. Get the attention of the audience right up at the top. B, benefit. What's in it for the audience? What are they going to take away from your talk? C stands for credential. Who are you and why are you qualified to talk to them? D is the direction of your talk, where you're going to take them, if you like, the overview. It's a bit like a book. If you look at the cover of a book, it entices you in. It's the attention grabber. 
The benefit, often they're telling you what the book's about on the back. There's often a little splurge about the author, which is the credentials, and then you've got the table of contents. Because remember, people are not reading your presentation as you're speaking it. You have to make it far simpler so they can take away the key messages. So I could use the ABCD technique with you. Why is it that so many people fear presenting? It's the top fear. Over the next presentation, I'm going to show you how you can conquer that fear and use it as an actor uses adrenaline. Why? I've been acting for 10 years. I've also been doing presentation skills for a long time and I know how frightened people get in front of a camera or in front of an audience or when they have to perform. Over the course of the next 20 minutes, I'm going to show you how you can utilize adrenaline to your advantage. That was an example of the ABCD technique. You only need a sentence for each of those A, B, C and D, and that gets you well into your presentation. The other thing to think about is when you end your presentation, I said earlier, end on a high. Don't be afraid of repeating your key message and taking your audience back to where you started. If you think about it, in Hollywood, they do this a heck of a lot. What they'll do is they'll film several endings to a film and they'll test it out on an audience because the ending is so important. Very often what will happen in a film is that the end links back to the beginning. So we might get a wide shot coming into a close shot and then at the end it pulls out again. I'm sure when you look at films you'll see lots of examples of this. And why not use it in presentation? It makes audiences think you're very clever. So that really covers the structure of a presentation. It's quite simple. All you need is a beginning, a middle and an end. And I'll say it again, keep it simple. So we've looked at how you can prepare a presentation from the words point of view. But one of the really key things in terms of planning and preparation is using your body and your voice. Because it's amazing, in the impact of our communication, all the studies show that only 7% of an audience's attention or the impact that we make comes through the words. 7%. 55% is transmitted through our body language and 38% through our voice. That means 93% of our communication is coming through the voice and the body and only 7% coming through the content or the words that we choose to speak. Now, in most presentations, most people are worried about the 7%. We'll slave over a hot computer, we'll slave over the script, we'll worry anxiously about whether we've got the material right, and very often people won't put the energy into the voice and the body. So one of the key things around preparation is to make sure you practice your presentation hundreds of times. Practice it, know it. Then you give yourself the best chance to perform it well. It's not good enough. I can be very eloquent lying in bed at night practicing presentations in my brain, but they're never the same as if I vocalize them. If I vocalize them, I know what I don't know. It's always good to practice it before you have to do it. Why leave it to the most frightening place in front of the audience to say it for the first time? Don't give yourself that disadvantage. So make sure you practice, practice it through and time it. Because often I think presentations suffer from being too long because people don't time them and they way overwrite the material. So practicing, timing, we say are very important. But also you need to warm up your body and your voice. If you think about it, no actor would go on stage without warming up their body and warming up their voice. And very often when you're very tense and you've got adrenaline in your body, you carry tension. And quite simply, you hold on to your uh, muscles and they go tight and you start to be this rather formal, stiff person that's communicating through adrenaline rather than through your natural self. You need to practice, you need to warm up, you need to get yourself hitting the deck running rather than warming yourself into your presentation. Because your voice and your body are what people will read immediately and they will make that impact and their decision will be made on how you start, as we've said before. 
So what can you do to help yourself really warm up? Actors like to spend a lot of time shaking hands and moving the body and moving the shoulders and really trying to just relax some of those muscles. Because literally, if you can relax the muscles, you can use them much more readily. If you're tense, you'll show it. So anything really that warms up your body and one of the key places is shoulders that get very tense. So you can roll shoulders, you can lift them up, you can lift up your arms, you can do all kinds of things that just kind of open up this whole area where your lungs are and where your ribs are and where your breath is, which is fundamental to how you talk and how you communicate. So shoulders and this whole area is very important in terms of preparing for a presentation. Often people say, I don't know what to do with my hands. They, I don't know where to put them. Well, if you think about it, if you're standing at a bus stop, your hands know what to do. But when you get onto the stage or you're in a presentation, often you start to panic. And that's when often people will do origami with the script and they'll be moving their hands around their script or they might even be clasping their hands in front of them or clasping their hands behind them. And sometimes on presentation courses, they've been told to hold their hands like that. If you think about it, it's incredibly unnatural. We don't spend an hour talking to somebody or 20 minutes talking to somebody with our hands firmly clasped. So let your hands go. They're part of your expression. They're part of who you are. And if you can illustrate with your hands what you're talking about, you're adding a dimension for your audience to keep their interest. You also need to think about where you carry tension because in your body you can carry it wherever and you probably know where you carry it. Do you have a jiggling leg? Do you get a quivering lip? Do you get tense in your shoulders? Does your jaw go tense? Start to try and get aware of where you carry tension because if you can get aware of it, you can do something about it. Another really key part of your body to think about is your face. And that needs warming up too. We have over a hundred muscles in the face and often we really show that we're the rabbit in the headlight if we're carrying tension in the face. And one of the key muscles is the jaw. If you think about it, this jaw muscle is used for eating and talking and we use that a great deal in our lives. And that's a place where we can carry tremendous tension. And if we're nervous about what we're talking about, often we allow this to become a little bit tight. So, chew a sticky toffee. You can be quite ugly with it. And really relax this muscle that's so important and so strong. Your lip muscles also need to be uh, exercised, so you can try all kinds of tongue twisters, things like red lorry, yellow lorry, red lorry, yellow lorry, red lorry, yellow lorry, or red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. Try and do them really fast, but keep accurate, and really make this part move. Because if you make your mouth move, that's what creates the energy and the expression of your voice. It's very hard to sound interesting if you do not move your mouth. That's when you become monotone and you really will bore an audience. So all these things need thinking about. And as we've said before, the 93% is really important in your communication. And all of that is underpinned by eye contact as well in your face because your eyes are what communicate most. You've probably witnessed presentations where people look over your head or they're busy looking down at their script or they're busy looking at their PowerPoint. Really try and connect with your audience because there's information that your audience will receive. You can also tell whether your audience is engaged with what you're talking about You'll see whether they look bored, interested, uh, wanting to ask a question. And that allows you to be in conversation rather than feeling that you're in a monologue. Your eyes are the key to you really being able to see whether your audience is focused on you and whether they're receiving your message. And then the final part that's really fundamental to any living human being is the breath. And the breath is what sustains the voice and sustains the body and it's the most important thing that you can practice. And yet, we're breathing all the time, we're often not conscious of our breath, and yet when we're nervous, we tend to breathe very quickly. And that's where we tend to build up tension, and we'll breathe quicker and quicker, 
and we'll breathe in a very shallow way and then our voice starts to do all kinds of strange things and we rush through because we're in adrenaline time. So one of the really key things that you can practice in your presentation is taking really deep breaths. Just try it now. Breathe right down to your belly because you should be breathing to what the actor calls the center or the powerhouse and it's right down here. It's not up in your throat. If you can breathe deeply, you can bring a much deeper and more authoritative tone into your voice, as well as using some of the high range of your voice. And an actor will spend a lot of time looking at the whole range that they can bring into their vocal quality to make the voice interesting. And as a presenter, I think you owe it to an audience to put some energy and some variety into the voice. After all, if you listen to a piece of music that was all on one note, you get pretty bored pretty quickly. And yet how many presentations feel like a rather monotone monologue? So really practice reading stories to children, practice reading articles out loud, or practice doing your presentation and really animating with your face and your voice and your body. And breathe deeply to get gravitas and power behind those really key messages that are vital for your audience to take away. We talked about opening with impact. It's really important how you start your presentation. But there are several techniques that you can use to open any presentation. You might use a rhetorical question. You could actually ask a question where you invite a response from the audience and you involve the audience right from the word go. You're in charge of your presentation, so you set the rules and the parameters. If you want them to join in and make it a conversation, ask them a question at the start and involve them. If you don't and you prefer to have the questions at the end, let them know that too. The other thing that can work really effectively as an opening to a presentation is using a prop or a visual or something surprising and unexpected. That tends to create an impact and makes them want to sit up and listen. And if it's something unusual, they'll be wondering where you're going to go with whatever you've chosen. One of the most powerful presentations I've ever seen was a guy who used a goldfish at the beginning. And he made an illustration of it by saying, there's a perfectly healthy goldfish swimming in some perfectly healthy tap water. In this other little bottle of water I brought along is some water from a plant where I've been surveying the quality of the water. Now, if I was to put that goldfish in the bottle of water or the equivalent of what's in that bottle, by the end of this presentation, that goldfish would be dead because the water that I've been studying is contaminated. Now that made a much more powerful and impactful start and really aroused my curiosity as part of the audience rather than just talking about the fact that he'd been surveying some water and his findings in that water. So using a prop or using a strong visual can really create some curiosity in the audience. The other thing that you can do is to use an imaginary situation. So you might say, just imagine what it would be like if you had X in your working life. And by creating that, you can take people into their imagination very quickly. You can use quotes, you can use anecdotes, you can use things that have been used in the news recently as an illustration. Because all audiences love metaphors, they love analogies, and they all love stories. Because we're all human beings and we were all kids who love stories. And the more you can make your presentation arouse their curiosity and use some of these things that I've suggested, the more you're likely to engage them. So story works, imagination works, props and pictures work, so does involving your audience, so do anecdotes and relevant things from the news. Any of those can be used and audiences will enjoy your presentation far more as a result. But you can always do your boring standard opening. The chances are though, they'll have gone down the route 350. So try and think about ways of arousing their curiosity. Because we have two sides to the brain. We have the left-hand hemisphere and the right-hand hemisphere. The left-hand hemisphere is responsible for all the rational, the thinking, the information, the data, the sequence, the analysis. And the right-hand side of the brain is the visual part, is the emotive part, is the part that goes into the imagination, 
is the part that likes colour, story, metaphor, symbol. Now, if you think about it, when we're preparing presentations, I think we tend to stick in the left-hand side of the brain because we're experts and we need to make sure our theory and our rational and our arguments all fit together. And we forget to entertain the audience by using the right-hand side of the brain, which is the part I'm talking about, where we add props, colour, we animate with our bodies and our faces, we bring in concepts or images that help to bring the story alive. That's when we engage the right brain. And guess what? Memory resides in the right-hand side of the brain. So if you want to be really memorable with your audience and you want them to remember your presentation and your messages, and you want to stand out with your message, you need to engage them in the right-hand side of the brain. Here's a little exercise we'd like you to try. Look at all these words. See if you can write them down. And I want you to remember as many as you possibly can. What did you remember? You probably remembered the first couple maybe two or three, and you may have remembered a few at the end. You probably only remember roof because it was repeated several times throughout, so repetition works in preparing a presentation. And you'll only remember something like Rupert Murdoch because it stands out like a sore thumb in the middle. So you need to put in surprising things to your presentation to keep your audience interested in terms of your content, or you can use repetition. And there's a wonderful world of oratory out there that politicians use all the time, and it's the rule of three. And often, they'll repeat things in threes. Tony Blair was famous for saying, education, education, education. Veni, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. Stop, look, listen to cross the road. A Mars a day helps you work, rest and play. All these things work in threes. And human beings tend to remember things in threes. So again, in terms of planning your presentation, think about making three key main points. Or use repetition and repeat the point three times. Often we're scared of using repetition, and yet it's very effective in driving a message home. So the next thing you need to think about is nerves. Nerves are a very natural part of presenting, and most people are very frightened of presenting because of the nerves they feel. In fact, did you know it's people's top 10 fear is presenting in public? Death comes second. It's kind of scary to think most people would rather die than perform in public. That's why so many people run away from presentations. If you can embrace that adrenaline and really use it, it can be a very effective tool for you to conquer and make your presentations better. Adrenaline is a very uh, primeval thing. It comes from the amygdala, which is a very primitive part of the brain, and it's the fight or flight mechanism. You have no control over it. It floods your system when you're under pressure and you're nervous. So you might feel the sensation of that adrenaline in your body by getting very hot and sweaty hands, or by your heart racing very fast, or by butterflies in your stomach, or by your face freezing, your breath becoming shallow, rushing, knees jiggling, your lips quivering. All this stuff can be a manifestation of nerves. And most people find it gets in the way. What you need to understand as a performer, which you are when you're giving a presentation, is that is part of the territory. So feel the nerves and learn to slow yourself down and use that adrenaline. So channel it, channel it to your audience. Stop thinking about yourself and the sensations in your body and think about how that adrenaline is really telling you you're alive in your body and you can give 100%. Everybody's had an adrenaline high and most people really enjoy it after the experience. Often we equate adrenaline in presentation as something we're trying to hold on to and not show an audience. Adrenaline needs to just be channeled forward 
so that you can really think about using it and making your mouth, your content and your body as effective as they can be. The other thing about adrenaline is often you have very negative self-talk. We often imagine ourselves doing the worst that we possibly can, forgetting the script, not getting it right, being asked horrible questions, uh, making a fool of ourselves. And I think that's the very root of the fear that we have around adrenaline. In fact, in bed the night before the presentation or while you're practicing it, think about it in a positive light. Think about using that adrenaline in a positive way. Think about yourself having a standing ovation. Think about yourself doing fantastically well. After all, most people are pleasure seekers and they'll do bungee jumps and they'll jump out of aeroplanes in order to experience some of that adrenaline. And they associate that with a very positive experience like that of being in love. In fact, it's exactly the same sensation happening physiologically in our system. That of excitement and fear. So start to see it as a positive rather than a negative, because that will help you. You can't do a good performance without adrenaline. So there you are. You now know everything there is to know about making brilliant, compelling presentations. But how do you know if you're any good? Well, the energy with which the audience responds to you, the way they applaud, the way they maybe stand to their feet, the maybe the feedback you get, the level of engagement that you get with the audience is your feedback. That will tell you whether or not you've just been okay and got away with it, or whether or not you've really, really reached into their hearts and minds and helped them understand something or see something in a new way, and that they want, crucially, to do something about it. And that really is the last point, which is the sort of feedback you want is not the sort of feedback that one of the characters from ancient Greece, Pericles, used to get, which is when he made a speech, people would say how finely he speaks. That isn't really what you're aiming for. It's nice when people say nice things about your speech and your presentation, but really what you want is for them to take action. And it was said that although people said that about Pericles, that, you know, how finely he speaks, Demosthenes, one of the great orators of all time, when he spoke, people said, let us march. And the point of that is, he knew how to make people do things, to make them want to do things, to deliver on what he had said that they should do, rather than just applauding the way he'd done it and the words he'd used and what a marvellous speech it was. They actually felt impelled to take action. That's what you're aiming for. So don't just try and get away with it. Really seize the opportunities that you've got in everyday working environments to really differentiate yourself as a great, great communicator, whether it's just over the table from one colleague or whether you're in front of an audience of hundreds or even thousands. Embrace the chance, do all the preparation, and like Demosthenes, hopefully people will say, let us march when you sit down. <laughs>